Moses. Moses and God's people had just left their slavery in Egypt. They were heading to the promised land. And Numbers 13 through 14 tells us that, that when they arrived, Moses sent scouts into, the, into the, the land, into the promised land to look and see what was it like there. They came back and they said it's a fertile place, it's a beautiful place, but the place is filled with evil people. But while some people, some of God's people, saw giants in defeat, Joshua and Caleb saw opportunities. And we get this great chunk of scripture here. The land, was pa- the land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land, Joshua says. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Just don't rebel against the Lord. Don't be afraid of the people of the land, God's, because we will devour them. Their protection has been removed. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid. And then you know what happened next? Everyone cheered, yes, yes, let's go into the promised land. That's not what happened. The whole community threatened to stone them. And then if you guys know your Bibles, you know the rest of the story, this is what starts the process of, the, of God's people wandering the wilderness for 40 years. Because they couldn't see the world through God's eyes. Practicing the habit of seeing the world through Jesus is what we're going to be looking at today. So let's start in Philemon. I'm going to be reading through it a little bit. Feel free to follow along in your translation. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what's right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. Say Onesimus. That's a hard name. I just want you guys to get it. Onesimus. I fathered him while I was in chains, and once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me, and I am sending him back to you as a part of myself. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you in the first place so that you might get him back permanently, no longer a slave, but more than a slave as a brother. He's especially so to me, but even more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. That's the text. So let's look at this here. This, we need to look at the for this reason. For this reason can also be translated as therefore. I'm going to teach you guys a little bit of, uh, a little bit of Bible study If there's a therefore in the Bible, you need to ask why it's it's therefore. And if you guys really enjoyed that dad joke, you're going to love the rest of the sermon. If not, you're going to be bored out of your mind. Number one, the real power is founded in God's love. Real power is founded in God's love. So last week we established that Philemon has power. He's wealthy. He has authority. Paul praises Philemon for not just using this power, not just having this power. He tells Philemon he's proud of him because he has used his power to love and serve his brothers and sisters in Christ. But here's the thing. We see today when it comes to the Christian faith, Paul has more power. Paul has more authority. Paul praises Philemon for having all this power and everything, but at the same time, Paul wants to remind him that, in fact, Paul is in charge, and he can tell Philemon to do whatever he wants. And let's be honest, that's easier, isn't it? How many of you guys have children or nephews or nieces or have ever babysat anybody? It's easier to tell somebody what to do than to reason with them and help them come to the same conclusion. For example... This is me. When I was doing my bachelor's at UW-Madison, I worked in a factory, 12 and a half hour days. Very hot place. That is Mara and Nina. Mason is in utero. So he's not in the photo. And when they were really little, I'd come home after 12 and a half hour days and I'd sit down on the couch and I'd have a cup of coffee or whatever. And my kids would come in, Daddy, why do you get to have coffee in in the living room and I have to drink my milk in the kitchen? And I had to explain to them, You guys don't have the motor skills required to maneuver the rough and tumble world of the kitchen to the living room. You guys can't, you guys just physically can't handle the ability to not spill milk everywhere you walk. When you guys look places, your cup looks where you look too. 
And I would explain it to them, and I'd talk to them, and I'd try very hard to help them get to a point where they understood why, but they kept pushing. So eventually, what did I say? I'm dad, and I do what I want. <laughs> I'm dad, I do what I want. I don't answer to you. I've already answered your question. If you don't like the answer, tough. I'm dad, I do whatever I want to do because I'm in charge. And the same thing, Paul could absolutely write back Philemon, just this, in big words, Philemon, forgive the debt. Why? Because I'm Paul. <laughs> That's it. Because I'm Paul. You know who I am. I'm in charge. I can do what I want. You guys like the hat I put on his head? I know. It's the, it's the little things. And there's a place for this type of response. For example, in the ER, on the battlefield, when an officer is in crisis, all those situations where it's, there's lives on the line, you don't want a person to say, well, wait a second, why should we use the defibrillator? This person is going into cardiac arrest, that's why. But would that really be the best option? Maybe we should just do some compressions. It's not the time to have a debate. You need to do whatever the person in authority tells you to do. Run there, do this, do that. Trust your training, you do what you're told. But in this situation, this is not that situation. Paul is trying to not save a life. He's trying to help Philemon and grow in maturity, and he's trying to deal with Philemon's heart. It's a heart issue. He wants to change Philemon completely, not just an action. He's trying to change Philemon from the inside out. This is why we go into this text here. He says, I, Paul, as an elderly man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I fathered him while I was in chains, and once he was useless to you, but now he's useful both to you and to me. He's trying to help him understand this is a heart issue, and he's useful, and he's good. Paul is trying to emphasize his motivation. He uses the word appeal. He tries to contrast. He's like, I'm not commanding you, even though I could. I'm trying to appeal to you. I'm trying to appeal. He wants to, he wants to use love rather than authority. And commanding is based upon authority, but an appeal is based upon friendship and mutual respect. Appeals are grounded in thankfulness. Love and healthy pride are grounded in thankfulness. We have this Dr. Pow. He says this. He's a theologian. He says this. Thanksgiving is the foundation for, for Paul's argument in Philemon. He starts with thankfulness. He ends with thankfulness. The whole entire letter is grounded in thankfulness. And thankfulness is an, a, a powerful emotion. And Paul wants to utilize this emotion. For example, we have Dr. David DeStano. He did a, a bunch of great studies into the power of thankfulness. And what he found over and over again was this sense of gratitude led to an increase in effort and an increase in time spent on a task and all kinds of great benefits. In fact, here's one thing he found, that people who spent, who felt, I should say, felt just a tiny bit of thankfulness, a tiny bit of gratitude, would spend an average of 30% uh, percent longer on a project. They would actually spend more time doing hard work, and not because they're forcing them, they just naturally do more. He also discovered that people who experience just a level, a little bit, 33% more gratitude, just a person who just feels gratitude a little bit, they actually double their financial self-control. Meaning if you're grateful, if you're thankful, you will actually spend your money more wisely, just naturally. And he found that thankfulness has all sorts of benefits, from academic performance to actually removing the feel of temptation. If you are thankful, you don't feel temptation so strongly. And Paul wants Philemon to intentionally focus on thankfulness. And this takes an effort on the front end, but as thankfulness becomes a habit, it becomes easier over time. And that's what he's trying, to, he's trying to tell him. He needs to do these things. He needs to think about this. And now here, and to ensure the, the letter doesn't get too heavy, Paul makes a joke. So you guys want to come up? I have, two, I have two helpers. Paul makes a joke. Onesimus' name equals useful. That's what his name actually means in Greek. And then Paul, the jokester that Paul is, I know you guys read this and were like, oh my gosh, Paul is hilarious. Paul says, you know Onesimus, useful? Well, once he was useless to you, but now he's useful to both of us. <laughs> In Greek, that's actually a joke. And because you're not laughing, 
I'm going to have these guys show you what a pun, a pun, this is a pun. It's a, a joke based upon a word. So these guys are, this is our intern, EJ. Everybody say, hi, EJ. Hi, EJ. And this is my son, Mason. And they've both been working hard this morning. They've been here since 7.30. So let's, let's see if they know what their stuff. Okay, ready? You need an ark? Because I know a guy. <laughs> Come on. Don't hate it. Don't hate. Okay, ready? Why aren't koalas actually bears? Because they don't meet the qualifications. <laughs> Some of you guys are writing them down. Don't lie. <laughs> Don't lie. I know you are. You're like, that is Christmas. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> Who invented King Arthur's round table? Circumference. That's a math joke for you engineers out there. I'm talking about you, buddy. And last but not least... Why can't you explain puns to kleptomaniacs? Because they take everything literally. <laughs> I go, you guys are done, thank you. I was rolling when I read that. <laughs> they take everything literally. I was like, oh my gosh, that is the height of comedy. I guess not so much. But he's, he's trying to be clever, but he's trying to lighten the mood. He's making a joke. But the point is, is thankfulness, thankfulness, thankfulness. Next, he says, I am sending him back to you as a part of myself. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. And Paul loves Onesimus, but he is sending him back because it's just, because it's right. It's the right thing to do. And we don't know the whole story, but we know that Onesimus, for whatever reason, owes Philemon a debt of some sort. And as a Christian, we pay our debts back. If you have a debt, you pay it. You don't go into debt unless you plan on paying that debt back. Better yet, don't go into debt. But the point is, is that he, has, he owes a debt and he has to return and risk the anger of his master to do the right thing. And always the good teacher, Paul reframes his request. Paul doesn't want this decision to be a matter of willpower. He wants it to be a product of a complete submission and thankfulness for God's love, both intellectually and emotionally. And then we see here again, this bowels, this word, he says, I'm sending you back a part of myself. I'm not going to go into it real deep. We talked about it at length last Sunday. But that's the word, that word, part of myself, is actually the mistranslation of these, these Greek words where they call it the heart. He's like a man after my own heart, like that kind of heart. But in this Greek, he's actually talking about his bowels. But in English, it doesn't sound right. If I said, hey, I'm sending him back to you as if he was my guts, you, that wouldn't make much sense. So in English, they translate it for us to understand it a little bit better. He says, I'm sending him back as a part of myself. But it's more intense than that. As, as we remember, Dr. Professor Helmet. Come on. I love that guy's name. I don't know if he chose it for himself or not, but he said, this Greek word expresses the total personality at the deepest level. This is not the heart. This is even deeper yet. It's the guts. That's the Greek word that he's using. And the point is that we're trying to, it's an all-encompassing choice, a decision that comes from Philemon's deepest understanding of not just who he is, but more importantly, who he is in Christ. If you are not gauging your life based upon the fact that you're a Christian, then your worldview is just wrong, according to Paul. And ultimately, Paul wants Philemon to consider Onesimus as an equal. This is why he says here, it's subtle, this is why his letter is just so brilliant. He says, so that my, my imprisonment, that you'll send him back to me to serve me in your place. It's a subtle point, but Paul is trying to tell him that he wants Onesimus to be Philemon's equal, his liaison, his representative. The language is subtle, but Paul is trying to help Philemon change his perspective. Leads to point number three. Living and acting out the love of God is a choice. We get this great text here. He says, but I don't want to do anything out of, out of, uh, without consent. I don't want it to be out of obligation, but of your own free will. 
And Paul's moved away from demands and commands and authority to the heart of God's truth and God's justice. He's grounding his argument in the love of God because God plays no favors. There is, and this is so important because when it comes to love, there's no compulsion. There's no manipulation. There's no force. And Paul is trying to activate the power of love inside his friend Philemon. And this is how we live a holy life. The word holy, try to rid your mind of the spiritual kind of nonsense that come along with the halos. Holy just means separated. It just means being different. And God is calling us to live a different life. And if you practice what God teaches in his word, you can eventually come to a place where imagine getting up in the morning and just loving on your spouse without feeling like you should. You just want to. It's not like you feel, oh, I probably should take care of this person. You want to. Imagine students, children, young people. Imagine going home today, and then you just do your chores and go even beyond, up and above and beyond to serve your parents. Not because you feel like you have to or because you're afraid of being yelled at or not getting your allowance, but because you actually feel like serving them. Imagine that. Now imagine everyone. Imagine that you've been verbally abused. Somebody has attacked you verbally. Your boss yells at you. Your professor belittles you. But you don't get defensive. In fact, you don't feel anger at all. All you feel is compassion for that person. Imagine when somebody treats you badly, you ask yourself, I wonder why my boss, what my boss is going through. Rather than getting defensive and getting angry, you naturally say, I wonder what this guy's home life is like. I wonder why he's so angry. That's a godly question to ask. This is important. The fact is that you cannot be happy when you're angry. How many of us want to be happy? You can't be happy when you're angry. You can't be joyful when you are judging others. You can't have peace when you're defensive. We have to change our perspective. Because this is where real power is found, to enjoy life despite life. And I wrote that down. This is power, to enjoy life. So I actually thought about, you know, I'm going to make a (laughs) t-shirt. Pastor Josh, quote, this is real power, to enjoy life despite life. They'll actually be for sale out there. I'm kidding, that's not true. But Paul wants to set Philemon free from his anger and his contempt. So by example, God wants us to be free from the chains of anger and the need for justice. How many times you get cut off on the road and you're so angry you want to chase that person down because you have some kind of goofy idea of justice. Oh, they need to know. But the reality is, get over yourself. You're not that important. The person didn't personally cut you off. You're just another human being. You think that they're giving you a second thought? They're not even thinking about you. They're driving on. And why is it that we assume the person who cuts you off is a jerk? How do you know that that person isn't rushing to the hospital? Maybe their kid's in an accident. Maybe we had an accident at the jumping place just down the street where the old Kmart was. Kid broke his leg, broke his femur or something awful. How do you know that that parent wasn't carrying their child, kicking and screaming, throwing the kid in the back seat, and driving to the hospital? And you're like, oh my gosh, you got in my way. How inconvenient. And you give them the bird. If you actually knew what was going on, you'd move out of the way and go, go, man, go. You don't know what's going on, and here's the reality of it. Angry people grew up in angry homes. Angry people grew up in angry homes, and then their parents grew up in angry homes. Alcoholics grew up in alcoholic homes, watching their parents deal with stress with alcohol. Bullies, alcoholics, addicts, all sinners, every single one of you guys is a sinner and you've learned to sin. And often the problem is is that it's not of our own design, we're all in our own little prisons. But for most of us we don't ever realize that we are slaves to our sin. We get angry and we blame everybody else. Oh, it's my parents. Oh, it's the government. Oh, it's the cops. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. But the fact is that you, each and every one of us, are slaves to our sin. This is why Jesus says, truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And we break free 
by embracing God's love, by intentionally choosing to reframe our situation that we live in and force our perspective to see the world as God sees the world. Brothers and sisters, people who don't know the Lord, you are forgiven if you just ask God for forgiveness. Over time, we begin to naturally, through the life of thanksgiving, free ourselves from those chains. And this is why we need to just change our perspective. And Paul says this, for perhaps this is why he was separated from you in the first place, so that you might get him back permanently, more than a slave, but as a friend, as a brother. And Paul is not playing a mind trick. He's not trying to manipulate Philemon. Paul's point is logical. He's trying to make a logical point. Paul has established God is love. And he's established that we should be thankful because God's hand is in our lives. So Paul says, it's possible that this whole thing was orchestrated by God for the sake of you both. This is a logical argument. It's an a, if A plus B possibly C. That's a logical argument. That's what Paul is doing. And we can practice this. We can slowly but surely see the world's obstacles and everything the devil throws at you as opportunities, as stepping stones to become the man or woman of God God has called you to be. There's this great story every, every business guru tells of a, of a businessman who goes to another country to sell shoes. He gets to the country and he realizes no one wears shoes. And then he comes back, he gets on the plane, he flies back and he goes, man, ugh, no one wears shoes. But another salesman goes, oh my gosh, did you know no one in that country wears shoes? You know how many shoes I can sell in a place where no one has shoes? Millions. And the point is, is that in these situations, they're identical situations. But the perspective of the individual changes the meaning. We see this perspective in Joseph. We're almost done. Story of Joseph. And all the way back to Genesis. For those not familiar with the story, that's fine. But Joseph was the youngest son of Jacob. He was unfairly favored by his father. He even, even, the Bible even tells us about he, got the, he made his son this very ornate, beautiful jacket. All of his brothers were super jealous. And his brothers, out of their jealousy and disdain for their younger brother, they sold their brother into slavery. And then when the dad says, hey, where's my son? They took that really fancy jacket and just to really drive it home, ripped it apart, smeared it with blood, and said, sorry, dad. Some animals got a hold of him and ate him. There's not anything left. As time went on, Joseph became a slave. But he honored God by serving his master faithfully. Eventually, he was recognized as he was recognized for his loyalty and his hard work and he became second in command to pharaoh second in command of all of egypt and it was during this time that there was a famine in the land and joseph's brothers who were in a totally different country were traveling and everybody around egypt were traveling into egypt because egypt had these storehouses full of grain they've been saving grain for years little did they know it was joseph he was the genius behind these storehouses and saving this grain and protecting them from moisture and keeping this grain during this lean season, this famine. And what happens? Eventually, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. He sees his brothers and he reveals himself. And they're afraid of being punished because they lied to their father and they sold their brother into slavery. And then he says, this is just amazing. Look at the change of perspective here. This is not a denial. We're not telling you to, den to deny truth. You planned evil against me. We're calling sin, sin. If you've done sin, it's sin. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame anybody else. If you have sinned, it's sin. But Joseph changes it and he says, but even though you planned evil, God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Christian history is filled with godly people choosing to see the world through God's eyes. People who refuse to see the world as a wretched and wicked place. And so many Christians nowadays, oh, the world's going to end. Oh, we're looking at blood moons and doing all kinds of nonsense. We're looking at the world wrong. We should see not a world that's wrecked by sin. We should see a world 
full of opportunities to save people through the gospel. Jesus refrained the whole entire thing, and he says, the fields are ripe, meaning people are growing in their faith. We just need to be loyal, and we need to go out and try to serve the Lord by serving others. There's power here. Seeing the world not as an evil place, but beyond hope, but rather as a place in need of love and care. That's where we should be. We need to actively choose to see the world as it truly is. We need to intentionally choose to live according to God's truth. And our lives need to be grounded in the foundation of God's word. And we, Christians, you need to be that grounding for others because they see Christ through your life. Somebody, we, don't, we can't close our eyes and see Jesus. We can't pray and ask for an angel to write across the sky, you're forgiven. The closest people are going to get to heaven in this life is by meeting a Christian who loves the Lord. You are a glimpse into heaven. Your homework, your personal journal, I've been telling you guys, I want you to practice thankfulness. There are so many benefits to this besides the fact that God wants you to. What is one new thing you learned today? Write that down. If you didn't learn something from watching this sermon, I don't think you actually were listening to the sermon. What am I thankful for? Something or multiple things you're thankful for. And finally, who am I proud of? Not a family member. Who in your life, when you're down, can you look at and go, I'm glad that they're doing well. I can live vicariously through their success and I want them to succeed. Who are you proud of? And let's glorify the Lord in that. So I'm going to ask for the tithes and offerings to come forward. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come do what they do. As they're getting ready, I want to remind you we're going to have one of our ladies down front for prayer. We're going to have one of our men over here for prayer. You got that? It's, it's heavy. And we're going to be going out with one last song here, and we're just going to ask that you guys also stick around. Lindsay is going to be leading our grow group after service. You guys are not going to get another opportunity to be studying under Lindsay unless you want to pay to go to Urbana. How many of you guys got a lot of money? Shoot, I was going to write your name down and come visit you. But I just want to pray one last time before we start. Father, again, we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you give us. We are thankful. And as we learned today, science has even found that when you are thankful, you are actually more willing to give to charities, willing to give of your time, willing to give more of yourself, because when you are thankful, when we are thankful, we understand that the things we have in our life we don't deserve, but they're a gift. And because we're Christians, we understand that every good thing comes from you. So as we are doing our tithes and offerings right now, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have a thankful heart and help us to give with a joyous heart thankful for the things and thankful for the extra money to give back giving back the first fruits of everything you give and we just pray lord that you be glorified through this time in jesus name amen